Hello, everybody. Hope you're doing well today. I see we've already got Quindy and Jedi Jared and Clavicus, and hopefully some other people are out there. Um, I guess let me know if you see any weird technical problems because we always seem to have one or another. Um, and I'm trying something new today, so we'll get to that part in a minute, but I fully expect it to go awry. Um, so last week when uh, I didn't make, oh, let me get this out of the view a little bit. Don't want to try to avoid the glare. Uh, last week uh, I had planned to do another dry brushing test, this time with something that was more like a typical texture that we dry brush, a train piece. I was going to use the wall of stone, I think, from Bones 5. Uh, and I'd still like to do that. Oh, hi Toe Prince Kempington. It's nice to see you live. Um, so I'd still like to do that. I think I also pulled out the docks from the Brinewind Extras expansion. I can't remember which one it was. Anyway, I do have some terrain standard dry brushing type textures and I'd like to do one or two shows testing all of the brushes we've been looking at on those. But now it's October, which is the month of Halloween, which is Reaper's favorite holiday. I think just about everybody at Reaper, that's their favorite holiday and they've got a lot going on and I'm betting it's also the favorite holiday of a lot of Reaper fans. So I thought I'd um, show some of the stuff that Reaper has available and some of the things you could, events you could participate in and stuff like that. Um, so I'm going to switch over to my dual view so that you can see what's on my table. Uh, so I'll get to that guy in a minute. But uh, while we give people a second to get here, this is the um, Nub, the Dwarf Butcher that I think I'd, um, I'd done a little bit of progress on him while I was at ReaperCon and I just thought I'd show you guys. Yeah, Queen D. Lurie, spooky season. Um, I thought I'd show you all how he ended up looking in the end. Um, I haven't posted pictures online yet. I sent some pictures to Ron. I don't think he's put them up in the store yet. Um, but I probably will do a blog post with this guy. So my most recent blog post was me talking about my experience trying to practice something after a workshop. So if you were at ReaperCon or you took some of the online classes at ReaperCon or previous events that we've had or other classes or workshops, it's good to try to practice what you've learned on your own and see how well you absorbed it. And I think you have to paint several minis to kind of cemented in your mind. So uh, what I talked about in my most recent blog post, which you can see over there, uh, is my experience trying to practice after a workshop that I took with um, Sergio Calvo Rubo, Rubio. He actually came down to Reaper and I went over there with some other Reaper people and uh, we took that workshop. This was a few years ago, obviously before all the fun. Um, and I had written most of this article and taken all the work in progress pictures and stuff. And then somehow it just kind of got left to the side. So I was working on that at the same time I was finishing up this guy. So I'm thinking of doing a follow up of, okay, here's what I studied and what I thought I learned. And how did I really end up integrating that into my process? Because that is harder to do sometimes than we think. And I, I have hopefully learned a few lessons and can help you learn a few lessons. But the blog post that's up now is how largely about how I think you need to use a different thought process when you're working on learning something, like how you assess what your work looks like when you're working on, you know, maybe you're following a video from someone's technique of, of wet blending or something, or you're trying to make a color scheme more like someone else. The way you assess that is different than the way you assess everyday painting when you're like, does this miniature look good? It's a different question. It's like, does this miniature look like the thing I'm trying to do? But anyway, if you care more about that, you can go read about that on the blog. Uh, but I just wanted to share Nub. I like him. I think I'm going to be working on, I don't have him over here, but uh, Chop and Chop and Grub, the two halflings after this. And then I'm uh, the, the other miniature I'm going to be working on, I'm not sure if it's public or not, so I, I also didn't bring that over. So uh, the first special Weeper thing that for uh, Halloween that I'm going to talk about is this, this little skull bust. 
uh, the sugar skull figure. And all of the stuff I'm going to talk about is just, if you go to the front page of Reaper, the, the reaperminiatures.com, the first couple of um, bars, you can click and find all this stuff. So I'm, I'm not going to tell you uh, numbers. But yes, as uh, the bot has just posted in chat, there is a painting contest associated with this. So you can paint this figure or any other Reaper figure that has a skull in it um, and then go to that page for all of the rules. And, and remember, read all of the rules for a contest because I, I myself have been disqualified from contests because of not following something in the rules. And I, just about everyone I know who enters contests has done it at one time or another. You can enter multiple entries and you can do minor conversions. And I'm going to talk about some uh, conversion ideas of, in a little bit. Um, but you can't, what you can't do, that's very important to know, is you can't share work in progress pictures. Uh, you shouldn't put, uh, like your watermarks on your pictures if you like to do that. It's meant to be an anonymous contest, not one where people are using votes for popularity. And the prizes range from $20 to $100 US in, uh, store credit at the Reaper store. So that's this guy, but if you get him in the package, which, hold on, I do have one in the package. So this is what it looks like in the package. And I believe this is a Bones USA miniature since it's definitely plastic and it says USA on the bottom. Uh, so you can see he comes in two pieces and I was initially um, a little confused about how to put it together so I just thought I would kind of, I have some glue set aside so if, if people really want me to I will glue it. But if you look there's kind of a bit of a diagonal on the one side of this post and it, and then a smaller diagonal on the other side. And that kind of notches in on the bottom of the skull. So I put this one together last night and I just used super glue. So I just had to hold it for a minute and then it's fine. And, and if you were watching uh, during ReaperCon when we were doing the live um, Bones mashup, you may recall that I'm very inept with super glue and glue hates me. So I didn't have any problem doing it. I would not anticipate that you would have a problem either. So I think most people are probably at least generally familiar with the um, idea of sugar skulls where they can be literally sugar. I think they also make them in clay. Uh, in Mexico, they call them calvera or calveras. And um, my second language in school was French. So I apologize in advance for butchering uh, Spanish at all, because I'm sure that I will. Um, but so I thought I would share a couple of uh, skull facts or Calvera facts as well. Um, so this is part of a cultural holiday in Mexico, which hopefully we are not being too disrespectful of doing this. Um, so edible or decorative skulls are made from sugar and clay to use in the celebration of the Day and the Dead, Dio de Muertos, which I'm sure I said that terribly. Um, so even though they're made of sugar, the ones that are heavily decorated are generally considered art and they'll have a lot of inedible things in the decorations They're not tended to be eaten. They do make some that are for eating as well. Uh, and the decoration items can include colored foil, icing, beads, feathers. The skulls themselves can be colorful, not just white. Um, and so I, I want to look at some stuff I have that I was thinking about. So I'm not entering this contest or anything. Nobody worry about that. I might have fun with one of these, but I don't think it's fair for me to enter a contest like this as a, you know, Reaper, someone who paints for Reaper. Um, oh, hi, green users. And, uh, but I just thought I'd share, like I was going through some basing stuff that I have that I thought, well, what would work as possible decorations? Because I think, you know, when it said minor conversions allowed, I think decorations are kind of more in the spirit of that than you know, sculpting a hat on them or something. Although they, I think they did used to have some that had sombreros, but they don't do that as much anymore. Um, these have been in production since the 1630s uh, using cast molds for the sugar skulls. So they press the sugar into molds. And traditionally they're created as offerings to be placed on altars called ofrendas to honor dead loved ones. So the smallest one represent children who have died and they're celebrated and remembered on November 1st, and then the larger skulls represent uh, departed adults, and they're celebrated on November 2nd. Um, and then another part of the celebration that's become popular is 
doing face painting in the style of the Sugar Skulls. So I'm going to pull out some stuff that I have that I thought might be cool to work on these. And I might even mess around with it a bit. So if you watched my, um, I did a class at the Virtual Reaper Con. It's either Virtual Reaper Con or RV, but I'm pretty sure it's Virtual Reaper Con and it's up on uh, Reaper's YouTube page now. And it's additives, mediums, and paste, oh my. So I talked about, um, this was one of the things I talked about, molding paste, and you can use it as a gap filler. Dark Magician says, I've never painted Sugar Skull miniatures, but I have tattooed plenty of them. Well, then you should have lots of ideas for cool patterns that you could paint uh, on a Sugar Skull. Or, you know, this little guy. Or There are plenty of skulls in the Reaper catalog, so there's lots of options if you can't get one of these. Um, and I think I saw John in the chat so i don't know if all of you know if australia and the uk stores have these yet but i think they are getting them but i'm actually going to show you the thing we i think we figured out is to try and show images on screen now so it's not going to be the cool way justin does it where it like overlays we haven't figured that out yet but i do have a few images so okay we'll get back to that one we'll get back to that too but this was so a few years ago at my art store they did um a similar thing with little plaster skulls so this is quite big this is about four inches tall i mean quite big in miniature painter terms um so this is one i painted for their contest and i don't the skull's not nearly as nice and detailed as the one that we have but um i was showing that partly because the skull they had was totally smooth, but I wanted to paint it with watercolor, so I put this, um, it's like this, but it's got some texture on it. It's supposed to be, make a surface like watercolor paper. And that gave it cool texture. If you wanted, you could do, if you have like a fine pumice paste, and you wanted this really to look more like sugar, you could, you know, cover some of it in the pumice paste. And then I have this stuff, which is molding paste, so I thought it might be fun if I did something uh, like, you know, they're decorated with icing and you can kind of use this like icing. You can just kind of, so let me zoom in just a little. The way I end up using it is I'm not trying to use the end of the toothpick as much. I'm trying to get a little point on the material and then I kind of drag it over. And I've used this, there was a, some Christmas cookies. Um, well, it, it came with like a little Yeti, but she had a plate of Christmas cookies. And I decorated the, did the decoration and the cookies before I painted using something like this. Mine's getting a little dry, I think, unfortunately. So you get that peak. You can do a similar thing with um, like Woodland Scenics water effects if you have something like that. So something that's like a gel that'll form these stiff peaks. So you could do actual textural patterns instead of just painting. And I would do this before you paint and then paint over it so you can paint whatever color you want. And then I was thinking about whether it'd be possible to even use something like this to kind of do flower petals or leaves like on the skull that the plaster skull that I painted. I'm not sure that it would be I might need to get actual putty to do something like that. But you know you could give them punk rock hair or something. So if you have any kind of supplies like putties or pastes you can kind of start decorating the skull even before you start to paint the skull. And I think it should be fairly simple just to do like little, if you just wanted like a little circle thing, but it might not be as simple as I said. Um, so that was one idea I had. And this stuff is water soluble. Uh, so you can shape it a little bit with a brush before it dries. Let me just find a place to put this so I don't get it all over my desk. And I think um, since, you know, I was just goofing around, I'm going to wipe that off of my skull in case I choose to do something different with it later. So you can see where it got in the cracks. And that's why it works as a gap filler, because it will get in cracks. But in this particular case, maybe I don't want that. So that's a way to, if you wanted to fill in the cracks, you don't want your um, sugar skull to be that anatomically detailed. You could just use a paste like that to fill them in. So I don't know if anyone has any uh, questions about how to assemble that thing. I think it seemed pretty easy, but if you have any questions, let me know. So that is, and, oh, and the 
deadline to enter the contest, I think, is October 31st. And then also there's, you know, a textured base if you want to include the base. So there's stuff you could do with that. So, oh, and let me just use our buddy for scale. So it does give you a little more room than a standard miniature to work with to, to paint designs. So you don't have to be nervous about trying to do freehand on, you know, something very small. Let's put that aside for now. Let's see what else there is. So the other thing that I had in my photos is uh, Reaper's doing a lot of gifts with purchase um, this month. In addition to the normal, oh, okay. Quindy is updating us October 29th is the deadline for entries. So thank you for knowing that and telling us because I got it wrong. Um, I wrote some stuff down and then apparently I didn't write that part down. So let me go back to my images and go back a little bit. So this is the graveyard entryway. And if you spend $20 or more, and I assume of equivalent currency, uh, if, if you're not paying in US dollars, you will get this with your purchase. Um, and then the next one, this is the pumpkin headed bugbear, and he comes in the ghoulie bag. So if, if you're a longtime Reaper customer, you are already familiar with the ghoulie bags, which is like a little goodie bag and it's got candy and it has uh, this miniature, which I believe is also in bones plastic. So I think this, this version that you're seeing on screen is a painted metal one. And I think it's only been previously available in metal. Um, but the, the one in the ghoulie bag is going to be plastic. Uh, and then it also has, I don't, I don't think I had a back view. Nope. Um, the bag also has a couple of paints and then some delicious candy. So let me come back. I do have the paints. Uh, so my, mine is not from the ghoulie bag. Um, so I don't have the, the pumpkin headed bugbear. I might have them next week, but I don't have the pumpkin bear headed bugbear currently, but I do have the paint colors from previous occasions. So nightmare black is actually, I think a standard paint in the line. Uh, but then pumpkin orange, pumpkin orange, I'm still saying it like the pumpkin headed bugbear now. Um, you can tell from the nine, six is a special edition color. And I did swatches here, but I'm going to swatch it on paper, uh, for you guys to see as well. So a funny little story about pumpkin orange. Um, it was originally, and that's my original bottle that looks all faded and beat up. It was originally a promotional color like probably 2014 or 2015 for Reaper East Suits thing, Reaper Artist Con, that it was like, it was very much a mini convention. It was just like an afternoon or a day of stuff. There were classes sometimes, but mostly it was just, you could kind of wander around and talk to the artists. It's a bit like the Kickstarter after parties are now. Um, but they would sometimes do figures and then paints for it. And a couple years back, I think somebody asked about pumpkin orange and and, and uh, Sadie said, well, we can't make it because we don't have it anymore. Because I think that when they match colors, they match to fluid color. They don't match to dry swatches. So they have um, the original bottles of everything that is standard production that they match uh, new batches to, is my understanding. And then my weird hoarding, my weird obsessive hoarding of paint came in useful. And I'm like, well, I still have my bottle of pumpkin orange. So I brought that to Reaper and now more of us are able to enjoy pumpkin orange. So I'm not going to swatch my really old one um, because I have maintained it, but perhaps I have not maintained it well enough. But then the other uh, kind of gift with purchase thing, and this is a gift with any purchase as long as they can fit it in. So I believe a single miniature, you know, a single blister miniature, um, they can't put it in that package, but you get um, breast cancer awareness pink, BCA pink. So this is the bottle I got last year, I think. I'm pretty sure that this color is the same, but then there are actually two versions this year. So this is the first time there's been a different version for BCA Pink. Oh, no time for both. Thank you so much for the subscription. Um, so I will swatch both of these. I don't know if there are more than two versions. I said something about how I had the original breast cancer pink, but I didn't have the other one. So if they wanted me to show anything off, they needed to send it to me and this is what I was sent. So I'm gonna assume that this is what there is. Let me see if I can 
get the light a little more even there. So I'm going to get out my swatch card and we'll do some swatching. I'm not going to swatch like my old one because I'm pretty sure that the, this is the same color. But I would also like to say, um, it, I think we're all fairly aware of breast cancer now. So I would like to recommend that people donate to organizations that um, research breast cancer or assist people who are dealing with breast cancer. Um, I think that the Komen Foundation has done good work, but awareness has been achieved and it's better to spend our money on trying to help improve the uh, chances and the lifestyle of people who have breast cancer. So I did forget to come in with my eraser because I normally do it in pencil and then add the, the pen over. So I will do that later for when I take a picture and post it, but you get to, I guess, see a little peek behind the curtain. As usual, or if this is your first time here, I um, shake all my paints off camera right before the show starts. So shake your paints more than you are seeing me shake them here. So this is the pumpkin orange. And this is one of those colors that, um, so there's something in paint called color shift. And that's if you have a color that looks different wet than it does once it dries. And I think pumpkin orange is a color that has a slight color shift. I'm also gonna thin it out a little for us to see the undertone like I usually do. And to test that theory, I'll get just a little, well, I'll just steal a little bit off here. And let's see if it looks different. See, I think it looks a little lighter in color before it dries. Because you may, when you look at it wet, you may be like, well, that doesn't quite look like pumpkin. But once it dries, it has a very pumpkin look. Maybe I stole too much. So I will try to remember to show you these uh, again later in the show once they've dried. And if you weren't here previously, I've done several shows on swatching. If you'd like to swatch your miniatures and find out more about what kind of paper to use, what kind of qualities you might check for swatching. This is the, the method of swatching that I ended up going with um, for my own use, but you may prefer something else. So this is Nightmare back Black. And this is one of those colors that will explain why I talk about why it's good to have, look at both the, you know, the mass tone, which is the color that comes out of the bottle. And it does look pretty close to black. It's not quite, but it looks pretty close to black. But as I draw it down and add a little water, you will find out that it's actually got a lot of very bright blue in it. And even when I file this in my paint section, I file this under dark blue, not under my near blacks. But that's a personal choice. You may prefer to file it under your blacks. Oh, I was, okay. I did make space to swatch last year's uh, BCA pink. So we can see if there's much of a difference. I forgot I did that since I have more spaces. You know, when I'm swatching the fast palettes and that's like a lot more paint, I don't always have space on my card. And I know that some people who are regular Reaper customers end up with kind of like a lot of this stuff. Oops, actually I screwed up. So that's the new one. I'm gonna to have to change those numbers. This is 2020. So this is 21, 2021, and this is 2020. No time for bull said, I recently used Nightmare Black on a mini. I was really amazed at how blue it actually is. Um, it, it is a good intense blue. And I actually like, so when I paint black, in the shadows of the black, I paint blue liner because blue being a cool color actually can appear darker to us, like a really dark blue, can appear darker to us than um, a true black because it kind of recedes from view. So those are very similar colors, if not identical. And now we'll look at, I'm very excited about this because salmon is one of those colors that I just, I have trouble mixing. So I'm always excited when I get new salmon color paints and they don't seem that popular for companies to mix versions of. So I'm excited to have this. I'm wondering if it might be a nice um, highlight for that Hoborn skin color that came out at ReaperCon. 
So that is definitely, um, when I was looking at my shelf, I didn't see a lot of other colors like that in the line. So I think that kind of fills a hole that we don't currently have available in Reaper paints. So I will try to put those aside somewhere where I won't put things on. We'll see how well that works. So those are the paints you can get. So the, the Nightmare Black and the Pumpkin Orange come in the ghoulie bag, which is a gift with purchase of $40 or more. And then Breast Cancer, um, Breast Cancer Awareness Pink, Pinks. One of the Breast Cancer Awareness Pink comes with any purchase provided they can fit it in the package. Um, and both the ghoulie bag and the, so the ghoulie bag, the archway and the um, breast cancer pink. I think they're all like one per purchase per day. So with the, the normal gift with purchase miniature that's kind of on all the time and this all stacks with that. That guy's a dwarf this month. A uh, dwarf sculpted by Tom Mason, I think. Um, so with that, if you bought eighty dollars worth of things, you could get two of the mini of the month. But you wouldn't get two ghoulie bags. It's only one ghoulie bag per purchase. So then the other neat thing that's happened is these have come back. And if if you weren't aware, because you're a newer Reaper fan coming in through the Kickstarters and stuff like that. Um, the Bonesylvanians that are available in Bones were actually not the first Bonesylvanians. So there was a set of Bonesylvanians released at 2014 Halloween. And well, actually, I, that's right, because Ron said that some of them. Um, so these ones, I don't have the other two. I mean, I have them like somewhere. I just happen to have these somewhere where I could find them because we packed up our house a while ago. But these guys plus the. Where'd he go? Hold on. There, there he is. There's an owl that if I have time later in the stream, I'm going to work on the owl and we'll, we'll use some pumpkin orange in practice. Uh, but these Halloween familiars and then uh, Olive, who's like a little vampire leaning up against a gravestone and like a creepy fish dude. And I'll, I'll have, well, no, I won't have them all in the pictures because I only put pictures of my own stuff in. Um, those came out at one of these artist cons that I was talking about. I think they probably came out the same year as the pumpkin orange. So these haven't been available for a, a long time. But then these other ones, uh, some of them were Halloween promotional items in 2014. These guys were actually Valentine's items. And it's very, they, so they hold hands. Wait, I think I got the one in order. And he's got a piece of flash that I was going to talk about in a minute. Um... So you can pose them together as if they're folding, holding hands, which I think is adorable. So these are, most of the ones I'm gonna show you, I think are sculpted by Bob Rodolfi. This one was sculpted by Julie. And then some of the other ones that, um, the ones I said were from that Reaper Artist Con, though Olive was sculpted by Jean and I now I'm, I, things I should have written down. We're gonna look at things I should have written down. But anyway, the ones I, I didn't paint those ones uh, from the Reaper Artist Con, and I didn't paint. There's a zombie cheerleader that's available right now too. Uh, but I painted pretty much all of these things. So I thought I would share my painted pictures. I can't share the miniatures because they're. Uh, Quindy confirms that uh, Gulp was also sculpt, was sculpted by Bobby Jackson. But um, Bob Rodolfi did like the vast majority of these. And so I'm gonna, I'll make a confession now. I was very intimidated when Ron first asked me to paint these guys because I, I was like, well, I don't know. Can I do a chibi cartoony style or will my style adapt to a chibi cartoony style? Uh, and I talked to a friend of mine, um, Elizabeth Beckley, who at the time she was painting a lot of chibis and she gave me some tips for the eyes and I looked online and looked at different kinds of eyes and then once I started doing them they were just so much fun like I had to kind of paint them in a rush because there were like three came out every week in both of those October so I was I had to paint pretty quick for me especially um, so they aren't all like a hundred percent my best work or whatever but I had a lot of fun doing them and so I highly recommend these even if they're not in your normal style of painting 
they are super fun to paint. And if, if you're someone who's getting a little burnt out or you like to take a break now and then, um, these are the kind of things I would recommend doing that. So there's a whole set of them that did come out in Bones Plastic, but the, the ones available this year that you can just buy from the Reaper store, they're not like a special gift with purchase or anything like that. You just pick out the ones you like. Um, they have not been available for purchase. So they are metal, and I don't know if we have anyone on stream who's like a little nervous about working with metal if you're used to working with bones. So I might go through just a few things talking about some tips for working with metal. Um, Art Mike Disney says he loves this one, and yeah, he's fun. He was fun to paint, too. Oh, thank you. Art Mike Disney also said he loved what I did with the Leprechaun from uh, Christine Van Patten. And yes, now that, now that I got over the hump of painting, you know, something a little more cartoony, and I'm not necessarily doing it, like I don't really do it in a cel-shaded style or a comic book style. People are doing all kinds of cool things with that. Uh, if you go look at the pictures from this year's uh, MSP Open on the Reapercon page, uh, there were several figures that were painted in like a comic book style with like that ink hash marks kind of thing, and they're super cool. Um, and then this is the other one, and the reason she's on this container, container holder, is I plan to paint her next week because she was in a monochromatic uh, color scheme, and I think that I would be able to finish painting her or get close to it in within our time slot. So now I'm going to go back to the pictures and show you the color versions. And if you have any questions, I so I posted uh, the you know Frankenstein like one and bride. I posted them on my artist Facebook page and then on Twitter. And what I have for these that I did find is I have my old recipe cards. So when I can, I try to write down the colors that I've used. Uh, partly for my own knowledge, but now I do it as much because I know people are interested. So I posted the, the you know, photo of this. Now, unfortunately, it didn't work on Instagram because you can't post multiple pictures if they aren't square or whatever. Instagram makes me crazy. Uh, but if you go on my artist page, uh, you can see all the colors I used. And then I will also put, you know, I'll probably do like three or four at a time and put them up on my blog post. So I'm not going to show you pictures of just those little cards right now, but I will be sharing that information if you're interested. So that, I could pass the, this is a thing about my image system is I kind of have to scroll through. And then also because of how the files are named, you're going to see the back view of everything first. So this is, hold on, I did write down the official names of these guys on my other paper. Because I mean, I got them before they had names, so, so I just, they're all written down on my papers as whatever the thing I thought they were, or whatever name I felt like giving them. So this is Howie, which is little fish friend. Oops, apologies for the noise. I have my cheat sheet notes off on the side. I had to prop them back up again. And here he is from the front with his, I loved his snaggle tooth thing. And his goofy little fish is going to snaggle tooth too. So he, he was fun. I liked him a lot. I didn't show these guys next to uh, Sir Forescale. I'll do that after we go through the pictures. And then there's a, that was a view so you could see the fish a little more. And then this is the, um, what is her name? Betty. Betty the Ghost Bride. And that's the figure I want to try to paint on uh, stream next week. So the thing, and I know I'm just the worst for using out of production colors, but remember I painted this in like 2014 or 2015. So all of those colors were in production at the time, but of the five colors I used, the only one that is still in production is pure white. So, um, I've gone through and figured out some alternate colors that you can use and it might not look exactly the same, but I think it might look even, uh, I might be able to get even more of a little glow and it'll look kind of cool. So this was the color mix that I used at the time. So Maggot White just got canceled. One of those was a sample, and then two of them are from the um, HD line that all got canceled. But there are plenty of blues in the Reaper paint lineup, so we should be able to find some substitutes. So that is Jake. I mean, I think we know who he might really be, but his Reaper name is Jake. 
And I was kind of nervous about doing all the like weathering on the mask, but it ended up being pretty fun in the end. And then there he is from the side. I try to give him kind of that maniac stare thing happening. If you can see the white all the way around someone's eyes. So if you have problems painting eyes in miniatures and, and there's white showing all the way around it, that's part of the problem is that um, here, if we go back to the front view, you know, he looks a little crazy because you can see the white all the way around his eyeball. It can also make someone look scared depending on uh, what else is going on in the face, but clearly he's not scared. That's not his issue. Then this is Maddie the Medusa. Which, and this is funny. So when Ron posted the graphic of all the figures and I was going through trying to see, you know, okay, which ones did I paint? Which ones should I pull out? I didn't think I painted this one at first. I have no idea why that my brain blanked out. Hey, David, we that I painted this miniature, but uh, I legitimately did. Um, I'm not sure how visible it is. It, it looked really visible when uh, they posted this on Reaper Live last week, but there's kind of like purple in the shadows in between the snakes. I was trying to mess around with some different colors. And there's another view of her. And then this is Mary the mermaid. And, and she kind of has that, uh, you know, crazy ex-girlfriend vibe, I think is what I was going for there. So I would not mess with Mary or her pearl. But it was a lot of fun painting the eyes on the monstrous ones because I looked at kind of different creatures. And, and then this is Elsa. And um, so this was an interesting challenge. And I found this with, uh, you know, traditional miniatures too, when you're trying to paint undead and you kind of want that filmed over eye look. But if you get too pale with it, then people can't see the eye, eyes. So you've got to kind of walk this balance between showing that they're undead and then making them visible as eyes. And then this is, this is her man that she holds hands with. He actually has different color eyes too. Uh, it's just a little more subtle because he has one brown eye and one hazel eye. Because, you know, if you were composed of multiple parts, you might not have matching eyes. And this is uh, showing how the uh, you can pose them so that their hands are together, which I think is very sweet. And gives you, it, so these would make a nice gift for someone I think, because of that. I mean, they all would be fun gifts, but this might apply to different holidays than the others would. And then we're back to the arch, which um, hopefully I'll have one of those next week and show you in person. Uh, if you've heard about the mail slowdown, I, I'm starting to think that really is a thing because, oh, let's force the camera to focus. There we go. Because, oh, thank you, Motor City Ray. Um, because my packages from Reaper seem to be taking longer than they used to. So just to give you more of an idea of the scale, because I forgot to include Mr. Four Scale the first time. And then, oh, the familiar, I don't think I showed the familiars when I was showing the metal before. And that's the scaredy cat. And what did I do with everyone else? What an excellent question. Oh, I put them in a little, little bin. So they're, they're, um, really, they're great for kids too. If you've got someone who's nervous about, you know, painting fiddly detail or you just want to break I think I painted some of these right after I was painting some uh, Dark Sword figures sculpted by uh, Tom Meyer. And, and I love his figures, but they're also sometimes a little like, just the, the detail can be very stressful sometimes. Um, and these were a fantastic antidote to that. So I will put those away, but I had the, um, So I already prepped this one, um, but I can show priming on this. Because if you're not familiar with metal miniatures, the most important thing that you need to know about them is that you do have to prime them. So where I will tell you not to prime Bones miniatures, and that's not a, an argument I'm going to engage in, unless you're brush priming. If you want to brush prime them, that's fine. You don't have to, but you can if you want. Um, but you do have to prime metal miniatures or the paint won't stick. So 
what happens is um, primer has kind of a chemical that etches in microscopically. So it creates a link between the metal and the paint that you put on. But then before you get to that part, you may or may not want to deal with things like um, mold lines, which is, very, I mean, obviously there are mold lines on bones, which again, you may or may not choose to deal with. Um, but these are the tools that I like using for metal figures. Now there are people who use knives uh, for metal figures, you know, usually the hobby knife. Um, there's a little you can do with the scalpel blade, but since it's thinner, it's not as tough. So this is actually what I recommend for taking the mold lines off bones. You kind of get under it and it's like paring a vegetable. Um, these things for me will dull out within two bones figures, which is not, not a great lifespan. I mean, those things don't cost a fortune, but they're not something you want to replace every five seconds. But what I like for uh, metal miniatures are diamond files. So these are fairly fine ones. Um, this, is, this is my backup one. So this, this was this Rio Grande, Grande company is uh, a jewelry company. And Reaper used to get in some of their supplies for the sculpture, so they had these in the store. Um, I think you even have to think if back in the day, I don't know if they do it differently now, but back in the day they, you would send them $10 for their catalog and then they would knock that off the price of your first order. But if you want to try just like general web searching, the key that I found is search for two millimeter diameter diamond files and that'll get you these smaller scale ones because it's really hard to tell what scale stuff is when you're buying it off an online picture. And I have some, um, you know, just generic Chinese files that I bought that way. And, and they're not as nice as these, but most of them work just fine. Uh, and then if you have stuff like this, so this is a little piece of flash. So this would have been, there's a channel in the mold that comes in. Zoom in. And sometimes uh, it leaves just a little bit of metal behind. So this is something that doesn't really happen with plastic miniatures at all. You get mold lines with plastic miniatures, but you don't really get these little bits that stick out. You do get a lot of flash with, with traditional resin miniatures. You can even get like a little skin. You know, there might be a skin in this opening between there and you just kind of, it's so thin, you just kind of pick it off. You can usually just turn this with your finger and get it off. If you have one that's harder, or you really want to be more careful about it, you can use these kinds of clippers. So these are, these particular ones are Zuron and I do recommend that brand and they they cut flush. I got mine at Hobby Town, so if you have a Hobby Town or a train store near you, they the um, model train hobbyists use these a lot. So these ones are designed so that they cut flat on this side and it mangles it on that side. Because you have to mangle it on one side or the other with these things. And you just kind of snip it off. But again, like I showed you, you can usually just do it with your fingers. Because that part you definitely, even if you don't want to get rid of the mold lines, I think you do want to get rid of that because that's just going to be hanging off and then when it does fall off, it will chip your paint. And then if you want to get the mold lines, sometimes the trick is seeing the mold lines, which I imagine the same is true on bones too. But that's why I actually wear my most intense uh, magnification level for prep most of the time. I don't always wear it for painting anymore. But this particular guy, you can actually see the mold line pretty well. And generally you just kind of follow it. It's like, okay, well, where would it go next? And if I'm having trouble seeing it, you look at the bottom. For some reason I filed the bottom on all of these. And here's a really big piece of that flash, but even this bigger one just pull off with my fingers. Uh, and then, so this is a half round, I think they call it. So it's flat on one side and slightly domed on the other side. And that's probably the most useful file shape. Um, I also really like, this is called a crossing file. So it's a, I'm trying to think of the word. It's not as tall of uh, the half round, but it's like two of them stuck together. And that's really good for getting, I mean, they don't, nobody has hair here. Oh, well, she can, let's do it here. 
So if you have, if there was like a mold line running across here or in between fingers, you can usually get down in those areas to get rid of that mold line with the, the crossing file. It's a harder size to find. And then the round is useful too. This is the traditional style file that, you know, where it's got like etched, I mean, it has sort of crosses in it. It's etched metal. Um, I don't like these for the main figure. The size you're gonna find, this is about the size you're gonna find uh, in these usually, so it's a lot bigger. You can't get in all the places. But it's useful to have these for if there's, there very often is stuff on the bottom of a metal miniature where it won't sit flat. Let's see. For some reason, I don't know. I filed the bases on all of those miniatures, so that was very peculiar of me. But yep, even the cat. Who knows why I was doing that? Oh, I think I do know, actually. Um, the reason I could find where these were is uh, my husband was using them as um, game pieces for working on a prototype game. So then you just take the file, and I usually do file in both directions. But some people say it's better if you just file in one direction. And you use whichever file gets in the area you want. And you get rid of that mold line. Again, this will depend on, you know, how you approach your hobby of painting, if it's important enough to you to get rid of it, or if you don't care. Not caring is a perfectly fine answer, but I just thought since it, it is, um, some of the tools are, and the techniques are a little bit different than plastic miniatures, and I know that we have a lot of people. I saw some comments when, when these were first posted, and they're like, oh, they're metal. I wish they were plastic. Um, they're... There are advantages and disadvantages to both, but I just wanted to share a few tips for that. And most people, I mean, these are not multi-part figures, but if they were, you can use super glue on them. I actually like to use um, five minute two-part epoxy because of my glue curse. And um, super glue, I'm trying to figure out the kind of, it doesn't do, it doesn't have good shear strength. So if something, bends or it gets a shock sometimes the glue will break where I think the um, five minute epoxy has better shear strength so I'm going to get rid of the little piece of paper because now I'm going to show you the primer they are cute in our I love these guys I'm glad they brought them back so other people get a chance to enjoy them so I will often put primer so this is a primered one and just as with spray primer you don't have to do like a full opaque coat. I usually do because I'm just weird like that, but it may even be better not. Like, so if you see just a, like if they're right there where um, on his eyebrow. Okay, now I have to do, do get the paper back because I think the camera hates the lines. Um, so that I think is actually a chip. But if you, there, there you, I mean, I pick gray, so that's not helping. But we'll see it on this one because I'm going to use white on this figure since this figure is going to be largely be white. So Reaper has three colors. They have the original white and they have black and then that's the gray that they have of primer. And I've even mixed them together to get the exact color I want. Um, this one I may not have shaken, so I'm just going to shake it off in the background. Um, so whatever you want to paint, you can get a primer color that's gonna make your life easier. So this one, I'll be painting, you know, the pumpkin orange, and then the, the owl will probably be like brown or gray or something like that. So the neutral gray kind of will work with all the colors that I plan to use on there. This, as a bride painted in a traditional color, is going to be, have a lot of white. So if I paint this black or even the gray, it's going to be a lot harder for me to get, you know, I'm going to have to pay more and more coats of white paint to get there. So why not start with white primer? So that's one of the things I like about the brush on primer is that you can kind of customize it that way. Um, so this is the consistency I have. I might add just a drop of water to that. Oops. And then we'll go more primer. So, um, Oh, that's probably good. But 
But there you can see what I mean about how the metal is showing through a bit. So for me, that's a little too thin, but in terms of would this work as making a good foundation coat for the paint to stick to, I think that's fine. And you'll find the same thing with brake armor. You don't have to have it completely opaque in every area for it to work. And also if you don't, with spray primer, if you don't get into like these little recesses that you're never gonna touch, it's not as big a deal. You can of course spray prime um, these miniatures that are metal. Those are the ones you can spray prime safely. Uh, but I live in a very humid place or maybe it's too cold or maybe like just spray products in general are very sensitive to uh, temperature and humidity. And then I also always like to have some brush primer on hand because if I did spray, but there's a little place where stuff has come off, like on this guy, I can just do a little touch up with my brush on primer. You can spray this through an airbrush too. You'll, you might have to thin it a little more. And I'm not too fussy about it. I mean, it's a self-leveling paint as long as it's, you know, you've added a little water if necessary so it's not too goopy. Because I don't think my bottle of white primer is super fresh. I use the gray a lot more. Like I have to go buy new bottles of gray sometimes. But I don't use the white as much anymore unless I'm doing... Kind of, I have done sort of, so you, if you're familiar with it, zenithal priming is where you start with black spray primer all over the figure, and then you use white spray primer, but only in the direction of your light. So you're, you're creating an initial uh, map of your lights and shadows with the primer. Uh, and you can do that with just rattle cans or an airbrush. Uh, but I've done something similar where I mix up, you know, I mean, you start with three values of primer with the black, white, and gray. I might add one or two to that where I'm using the primer to give myself my initial thing. So if I was painting this to match the picture that I showed you earlier, I would paint the dress in the white primer. I might paint the face in the gray primer. And then I painted her hair fairly dark in the original one so I could paint that with the black primer. And that would just give me an idea of my values over the figure as a whole. So that's pretty wet. I would let it dry and then, because I feel like I got everything, but I guarantee that when this dries, there will be little bits where the metal is showing. Um, oh, hi, hi, miniatures and raiders. Uh, I, I missed that you were here because I was priming away. Let me just see if I missed anything else. Uh, Motor City Ray says, my only wish is a Reaper would release bigger bottles with a primer fresh air brush folks. And I agree, yeah, bigger bottles would be handy for that. Um, so uh, for the miniature gen raiders, I'm looking at some of the fun stuff that Reaper has for uh, Halloween and how to work with those products because you know some people aren't familiar with metal and there were a few others. We were looking at some of the paint colors. So I was just giving her an initial coat, but I would definitely come back and check because when the when it's wet, it's really hard to see whether or not you missed an area, but because it's shiny metal, once it dries, I guarantee it will be easy to see that I missed areas. So we'll take a look at that. I won't necessarily make you watch me do another coat. Um, and then this is uh, another figure painted with gray karma but I just wanted to give you people, I've seen a lot of questions online sometimes from people who are very stressed out about, you know, how do you use brush primer and they're worried about filling detail or, you know, do they have to get everything everywhere the same thickness? So I just wanted to show you that I approach it in a very casual way. Um, if I were doing this in person, the only thing that's different that I would do, and I'll just do this very briefly, is I might look for areas where, um, you know, it's pooling a lot and just pull those out with my brush and I would look for places where there are bubbles. And I would do the same thing with, uh, you know, if I was just doing an all over coat of paint, if I was painting like a large area, you know, I was painting her dress white, I would be doing a similar thing. I don't fuss about, you know, primer coats and base coats. And then another thing I do is if there are little bubbles and some colors seem more prone to this than others, um, 
And I'm going to take away my thing because this. So you want to let it dry a little bit, but let's pretend that there were little bubbles on here, which sometimes happens, especially with texture. So this is canned air like you use to dust out your computer. You can depress the trigger on this with a little more finesse if you want. So you don't have to have a big, here, I'll do it over here. You don't have to have the big poof. You can kind of just well, do like a little. So I would do a very little one and it pops the bubbles. If you have an airbrush, I mean, it's even easier to do it that way. I just don't typ typically keep my um, airbrush plugged in and ready to go that I can use it for that. Um, see what else was I going to show you so I showed you the priming and the figures oh when I was showing you stuff for the sugar skull there were all kinds of things I showed you what you could do before you paint but I didn't show you a lot of cool things afterwards so for the sake of our raiders let's talk about what the sugar skull is again um, where did my package go so Reaper is selling uh, these busts of a skull like that's like the Calavera used in the Day of the Dead um, celebrations in Mexico. So here's what he looks like put together. And this is next to a standard figure. And they're running a contest that I think someone will hopefully put a link to in the chat. Where you can paint this or any other Reaper figure that has a skull. Uh, enter it by October 29th. Read all the rules that's in that contest chat. Uh, and you could win some store credit. So uh, earlier in the show, I talked about how you could use something like molding paste to kind of simulate the icing that people use to decorate the um, sugar skulls. And, oh, do we have more Raiders? Oh, wow. Hi, Michael Mordor. So uh, for our new Raiders, we're talking about some of the uh, Halloween fun that Reapers got going this year. And this is one of them. This is... Um, a figure you can buy or you can use any reaper figure you might already have that has a skull on it and it's a like a sugar skull decorating contest so um earlier in the show i was showing how you could use like molding paste or green stuff or whatever you could make icing you could put shapes on there so minor conversions are allowed as part of the contest um i figure you could use like a fine pumice paste or something if you really wanted to have more of that sugar texture you could do something like that um, but there's also other things you could use as decorations either before or after painting. So I kind of just went through, I don't know about you, but if you've been painting for any, any length of time, you've probably collected like all these weird things to use on bases. So I was going through my collection of weird things to use on bases to look for stuff to share. So these are like little craft gems that you could stick on things. And they're actually handy because they're flat on one side. And they use stuff like beads and gems to decorate the um, skulls. So this would be something pretty cool to use on them. And you could put it on afterwards or you could put it on before and paint it as a gem for a, more of a painting challenge. And some of them, I mean, this little diamond is really quite small. If we look at it next to the skull, they would totally be an appropriate size, I think, for um, decorating a sugar skull. I have more of those types of things that are a little bit different see if I can find those well these are kind of shiny rocks they're something else similar you could use like that and then you could paint them as gems so if what you if you just have stuff like gravel or whatever in your um, basing supplies you could apply it before you paint and then paint it to look like a gem so these are some other ones and these are all just things from the craft store Painterly Git says you can't share the link. Um, I'm not sure which link you're trying to share. I think only mods can share links on this channel. So um, if, if I could understand what kind of link that you're trying to share, the mod might be able to help you out. These are a different kind of gem. They'd be a little harder to use because they um, aren't flat on the back. But you could start by using some of that sculpting stuff to make a little base for it. Uh, if you do exclamation point sugar skull, 
it'll it'll share the link. So there are um, like commands like that for all the repo type stuff. So these gems aren't as great, um, but they might still work if you have something like this in your stash. I was hoping for slightly smaller versions of this kind because I did see some sugar skulls that had, you know, when I was doing a search that had something like that kind of in the center of the forehead and look pretty nifty. Um, what else did I grab? So you could, this is some um, gears and stuff like that. So you could do like a mechanical version or a steampunk version. I think I have even more steampunk here. Yeah, these ones are more steampunk here. And again, for anyone who came new, I will not be entering the contest as a Reaper painter. I don't think that's fair of me to do. Um, so I'm just trying to give you guys cool ideas so that you could enter and do really well. Big Apple SD77 says there's pretty cool stuff in the scrapbook section of your local craft store for this kind of thing too. They are flat and adhesive on the back. Yes, I would absolutely, when you go to the um, craft store, like if you have a big box craft store like Michael's or Joanne's, look all over. There's all kinds of stuff in the store that they might not be marketing directly to you, but might still work for um, miniature stuff. Like I don't think these would work for the skull unless I wanted to decorate his platform or make my own platform or something. I mean, I guess I could give him a little crown maybe. Well, there's a bigger crown. Do something like that but these are all beads from the jewelry section and I've used these in some painting projects for various things and I would like to use them in more things because I mean this could be like a planter in a diorama or something so there's all kinds of neat stuff you can find in your craft store the sewing section might have little buttons that would work to stick on here but also just check stuff that you have at home, particularly if you have another person in your house that is a crafter of a different sort. They may have things you could plunder to make cool stuff for your skull. So this, this is a supply that is made for um, miniature painters, more often historical miniature painters. But uh, So this is called brass etched um, details. So these particular ones are leaves, uh, and you could snip it and pull it off there and you know, attach it to the skeleton. You can also shape them so that they make like plants or whatever. And I have a bunch of these. This was just the one that I pulled out to show you what this product is. Um, because I've seen some that are like crests of nobility and things like that. And then these are, I don't know if they're gonna show up on camera. Let's see if I can isolate one or two. And now I'm gonna forget the name of his actual store. But there's a painter called Greg Zuniga who has Wicked Elf. And he makes um, some cool little details out of vellum. So you can paint them up, there's a dragonfly. But these would look pretty neat. On the, and again, you can shape these just like with the brass, not quite to the same degree, but you can shape them so they're butterflies with their wings up, not just flat down, but because of you know the skull decoration, flat might work well for that purpose. And then you can also get live plants. These, I think, are sold for people who are doing um, fancy nail polish. So they will pull one of these off and like put it on the nail polish. But they're little tiny flowers. And that's something else that would be cool to decorate the skull with, I think. These are also very useful for bases. If you saw the um, Art of Mike Disney was mentioning the um, little leprechaun guy that I painted. And that is, this is what I use to make the, I was trying to make them look like four-leaf clovers. Or just clovers in general, not necessarily four-leaf clovers even. But this is what I used for those, was I think this color even. And I just pulled them off with tiny tweezers and glued them on. Hi, the Ball Jam. Thanks for, thanks for coming, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Um, so I, I have finer tweezers than this even as well. These are my tweezers for pulling hairs off of miniatures when I'm painting. Um, and then you can just glue them down with super glue or a little bit of Elmer's style glue. So there's not, this would be a pretty color on a sugar skull, I think. The teal, kind of teal and white mix. 
So there's all kinds of options for cool ways you could decorate your skull, not only with paint, but with fun objects. And so we talked about flash and mold lines and all of that stuff. So now I think I do have time to paint an owl on a pumpkin. So let me just add a little bit of primer to those places that I noticed. Now the ideal thing with primer, and this is true whether it's um, spray primer or brush on primer, is you want to let it sit and cure for a while, especially if you plan on handling the figure. I did not do this. I painted this last night, but so it is. Oh, now we can see. I think she's, so it's mostly dry. I would give it another minute before I actually paint it over it. But um, it's nice for giving us an example of, you know, one coat. And most of this is, even though you, you can see the metal through there, it's probably fine. I myself would do a second coat because I am over thorough sometimes. But what I would really look for if I was doing it is any places where I'm seeing the metal still shining because those will be places that I missed and then I definitely want to hit those particularly if they're like the edges of things or places that people are you know you're likely to pick the miniature up by the head something like that I would add a little more um, primer but now let me see if I can get my wet palette out without causing a ruckus To shift this to the side a little. So. All right, so don't don't get dizzy. I'm gonna shift the camera just a little. I thought I had this set up right, but I didn't. So I have tried in the past keeping my palette in the frame so that you can see it, and the camera seems not to enjoy this. So I'm not trying to hide what I'm doing with the paint. I'm just getting a palette paper. I will try to show you my palette now and then. I typically don't thin my paint a lot unless I'm doing washes or glazes, so there's really not that much to see over on the palette. So I'm going to start with the pumpkin so that we can check out the pumpkin orange. Uh, Big Apple asked, did I do my pumpkin head bugbear? I don't actually have a pumpkin head bugbear, so I didn't get a whole, um, they sent me a couple of things so that I could show you, but I didn't get a whole uh, ghoulie bag. But I had to place an order a couple of days ago, so hopefully I will be getting a uh, ghoulie bag, and then I will have a pumpkin head bugbear. But I actually, the next miniature I have to paint for Reaper is... Christmas, so. <laughs> Which, this is earlier than I typically get. Well, actually, that's not. The next miniature I have to paint, I don't, I can't remember if they already showed it off on Reaper Live, and I'm allowed to say what it is or not. Um, is the focus all right on here? Let's make the camera focus again. Uh, so I'm, I'm not showing that one at this time because I can't remember if it's public or not. But then the one after that will be Christmas, which will be unusually early. It is usually the case that sometimes they even put out the 12 days of Christmas graphic and there are little spaces in it or silhouettes or something. And that's because I'm still frantically painting away. The painter being at the last at the end of the line for uh, stuff is not always super helpful. <laughs> so now I kind of have to decide whether I want to make him like a lighted eye pump jack-o'-lantern like it's lit, but I think it has the stem on it, so it hasn't been cut open. So I'm actually gonna use the Nightmare Black because I'm not, I'm not sure if I'll be able to figure out a lot of places to put the 
Nightmare Black on this particular figure, since owls aren't very blue as a rule. I mean, I could paint them as maybe a moonlit, creepy blue owl. But while, while I'm here, I want to see if this works. So orange and blue are color complements. So I suspect if we mix these together, we are going to get a brown color that might be useful. But it may not work because if there's enough yellow in the... Hold on, I've lost my pumpkin. If there's too much yellow, it won't work. Yeah, it's turning more green than brown. It's a neat khaki green, though. I mean, I can use this on the stem of the pumpkin. I'm put my pumpkin there so I don't lose it. And then for those who weren't here earlier, I'm going to paint this figure next week in a monochromatic color scheme. And I can show the pictures again in a bit. So I do have to decide how I want to paint the owl. Normally I would have done I would have gone to look at some pictures of owls, even for something that's just a little fun, because I like, I like to look at pictures and know what I'm doing. I feel like he's kind of, um, he's going to be a brown owl, even though I didn't, I didn't bring a lot of brown with me, so maybe he's not going to be a brown owl. I will instead use Ashen Brown, which is, it's, been in and out of the Reaper line repeatedly, and it recently came back out via the uh, Kickstarter paints. But it's just a gray with, with some brown in it. So it's kind of a browny gray. And if I get to the point where I can paint the eyes, I will probably uh, stop and look up eye, owl eyes on my phone because I do like to reference things like that before paint them and then interpret that in a cartoony way. Yes, yeah, so uh, Reaper John is talking about the uh, Reaper Challenge League, which if you don't like the idea of um, a competitive contest, you know, you, you just prefer to paint for fun and you get stressed out if you're painting, you know, feeling like you have to paint in a competitive way which is a totally reasonable, understandable way to feel. Uh, the Reaper Challenge League is a different kind of thing. It's The point is to challenge you to paint more. It's not necessarily, you know, they're not being judged against anything else. It's, you know, certain subjects that you paint and then painting them within the, I think it's quarterly. Maybe John can explain it more or he just posted a link that will probably tell you more about it. So I think that's a great idea if you need motivation. Because the one thing, one reason I used to like to enter contests is it just made me paint. I mean, it was like I was I would kind of have trouble motivating myself to get in the chair and paint and deadlines helped. And so if there was a contest that was coming up, it was like, well, now I have to paint because I have to finish this thing for the contest. So if you like that idea, but you don't like the idea of stressing out too much, painting... Um, competitively or feeling like you're going to be judged against other people or whatever this is a nice way to get the deadlines without the stress if you look at the pictures of um these, these uh, Halloween familiars. This is just one of the ones you get. So in that box, you also get the bats on a gravestone and this fun little scaredy cat, which I'm wondering if I should also have prepped one of those so that I could be switching between them because now I'm going to have the problem of um, waiting for paint to dry. And I recently learned, to my dismay, that it really is not ideal to use a hairdryer on drying paint. Green user says it's nice to share pictures of what you're doing as well as see what others are doing. And that is very true.
And at Reaper, we love seeing everybody's pictures. We're not being judgy and thinking, oh, we only want to see what you have to do if you're like a super amazing painter. That is not true. We want to see people having fun and using their figures. Which can be just painting. I mean, I, I play in games, but I don't typically play with uh, figures other than the Reaper Errant game that Nightheart runs. Um, well, right now, we especially don't use figures in my home game because we're all still on Zoom. I think even when everything's perfectly safe, we'll probably still end up on Zoom because it's, you know how it is when you're adult and some people have children and some people have this and that. So the Zoom thing seemed to be working out well for us in terms of actually getting people to the table it was easier if it was a virtual table. Because then they were still home to run deal with emergencies or dogs that need to be let out or whatever. In our case, cats. I'm actually very surprised that my cat, or one of our cats, hasn't come to uh, insert himself into the show because he was very agitated while I was getting ready. He was bugging me and my husband. He really wants to go outside is what his problem is, but... Um, He's only allowed outside, allowed outside on leash. And he already went out once today, and the second time he goes out is usually like at four. So I don't know why he decided right after lunch that it was time to go outside again. But I expected him to come and have some comments for us because he was just wandering around yelling. So anyway, I was saying, I recently found that... Um, so I follow Golden Paints and Liquitech Paints because they often have a lot of good information just about paint in general and then about um, the mediums. So like when I was showing you that, uh, where did I put that weird stuff? The flexible molding paste and other you know mediums and additives that can be very mystifying to those of us in the miniature hobby. Actually, they're pretty mystifying to traditional artists too. Uh, so they will have like informational seminars and stuff like that. And they were doing a seminar on a paint product that I was interested in. But during that, somebody asked whether, you know, how you would speed up the drying time of these paints. And the presenter said that you could use a fan uh, in the room. Like, you know, the, obviously assuming that most people are painting pictures. Um, but that it was best to avoid a hair dryer and... I mean, I have used a hairdryer a lot to dry paint, and it hasn't been a big issue, but I think it may have been a problem once or twice that I didn't realize that's what the problem was. So what she said was, is there's a difference between cracking and crazing. So I don't have my little, I have a paint film somewhere that I've poured out a bottle of paint, and it, it makes kind of a sheet of plastic in a way. Uh, so I don't have that here with me, or I would use that to show you what I mean. But... Um, Let's imagine that this paper, let's zoom out a little. Let's imagine this paper is the paint film. You, the acrylic paint is pretty flexible. You can do stuff like this. This is why it's great on figures because, you know, if the leg bends or whatever, it's usually not going to crack or anything. So being able to survive this, this is what they, when they think about cracking, it's this. It's like if you went like this, maybe it would crack. What they call, if you just paint a flat surface and you see some lines on it, they call that crazing. And crazing, apparently, is caused when, um, so the, the, the top layer, the top surface of the acrylic paint has dried, but the underlying surface has not. And as the water starts to evaporate out of the paint underneath that skin, it has to make a crack to get through. So the water's evaporating out and it has to make a crack. Uh, or a craze, they call it a craze. And the one I had noticed that a few times years ago when I was just painting base rooms, mostly was where I would see it happening. And probably what would happen is that I was trying to really rush that and I would, you know, paint a coat, hair dry it and try and paint a coat right away. And the particular color that I was using, maybe it was more sensitive to it than others. But I have used a hair dryer plenty of times. I think our paint is so thin, the layers compared to what they're talking about for, um, you know, general acrylic paint use. Although in this particular case, they were talking about a bit more of a fluid paint. So I, I will probably still do it a little bit, but I will probably try to curb 
how much I use a hair dryer, which is, I mostly just do it on like a situation like this with this base coat. Cause I'm sitting here having to ramble on at you cause I can't paint on this figure anymore <laughs> until the, um, you know, you can see it's still shiny. So it's very much not dry. So I am tempted to put mute on and just hair dry this so that we can move on. Cause I'm still going to need another coat, even though the, the orange coated pretty well. Um, and remember I was going over gray even. So that's a pretty good coverage orange. Uh, but I still, for full coverage, I would want another coat. I think the bird is probably fine with one coat. There's just a couple of places where I might have missed getting some paint. So I don't know, what does Ann do with you guys when she's waiting for her paint to dry? I've watched some of her streams and yet now I cannot remember. She probably works on that. When I was watching, she was working on a dragon, so she could just work on a different paint part of the dragon. And I'm working on a very tiny little guy, so there is no working on a different part. So I think I'm just going to go ahead and take the risk and use the hair dryer. Rings Raccoon says I have a hair dryer that has no heat setting that I use. Actually, yes, that's um, if you have a, a hair dryer that will. And Don Don Mal pointed that out too. That has uh, just an air setting. I'm not sure that mine does. Let's take a look. That should work. Oh, you know what? I have a button. I think it might work. So I'm going to turn the sound off so you don't have to listen to that. I meant to make up a new one of these. This is the same question I asked last time. We had to uh, have a brief break, but. We will just have to go with the same question and I'm going to mute momentarily. So if someone comes on and they're like, how come I don't hear anything? Please let them know why. And I shall be back in just a moment. And I'm back. Um, weirdly, my hair dryer, you have to hold that button to have the no heat option. Sure, why not? All right, let me just check the dark section first because that's inside. And that part didn't quite dry. But we will get the orange going on the rest of it well thank you guys for helping me learn something new today I probably noticed that button once and then never thought about it again because I don't I hardly ever dry my actual hair with a hair dryer um, so I probably just don't think about it that much That is the only hair dryer in our house that's attached to my paint desk. Rings Raccoon said to answer the question on the sheet, which is what character type do you like to paint but hate to play? And his answer is undead. I really hate undead, but they are fun to paint. I can agree with that. Unless it's just a little easy to kill skeleton or something. I don't look forward to seeing them at the table. Tom Mel points out that if you have an airbrush, you can use that on just the air setting. So you need a dual action airbrush so that you can push down just for air and you're not pumping paint and it works to dry things as well but I usually maybe I should figure out if I can leave my airbrush uh, hooked up all the time although where where I currently would have it hooked up the computer sitting in front of so 
that would be a problem. I meant the, the laptop. The laptop that I use for streaming, um, when I'm not streaming, I normally push it back further on my desk. And that would be where my airbrush stand is attached to the edge of my desk. It is amazing how much space all the streaming stuff takes up. So I'm just kind of trying to get where the teeth are carved because those should have, you know, some shadows and highlights from that side at least. And then I don't think my the greens, the paint I made for the green stem is not the most opaque. Going. So that was mixing together the pumpkin orange and the nightmare black. And if you haven't tried that, I recommend like just mix together some funky colors and see what you get. Because sometimes it will be very different than what you might imagine. I think that owl looks like I got everyone important. Now I have to figure out what would I shade this pumpkin orange with. So when I, I brought over a little selection of paints, apparently I just uh, zoned out and skipped brown. Because <laughs> I just kind of went through my paint shelf looking for, oh no, that's because I meant to use these colors. So other colors that were in the Kickstarter um, that I hope will release soon are these um, oxide yellow, oxide brown, and oxide red which they're kind of, they're very similar to the clear paints in purity of color. They're just not called clear because they're not clear. They're nice opaque paints because they're earth colors. Um, Mintros24 says, on the opposite of the question, I love to paint f play fighters, but hate to paint them. So is that, you don't love painting armor? That would be my guess. I did not shake this one very well. So for the benefit of um, people who haven't seen it before, the reason I knew I didn't shake that paint very well is if you look at this, it's very watery. Um, and you know, some colors are kind of transparent and stuff. I know that this one isn't, but let's say this had been the first time I used this paint. But even then, what I'm seeing is a lot of medium. So um, brush on sealer is essentially medium. Um, so what I'm seeing is that. So if I take a little bit of this color and mix it in, that's, if you see that kind of thing when you first are trying to dispense paint from a bottle, that means that your paint isn't well mixed enough. Or possibly stuff will, um, stuff will get stuck up in here sometimes. So that's not the problem with this paint. There's nothing stuck up in the um, nipple. But if you get stuff stuck there, even if you're shaking the paint and what's in the body of the paint is well mixed, if stuff is stuck here, then you're just getting paint that's out of there. So sometimes you have to pop that off and take a look. Yeah, Mint Rose, I, I get what you mean. I don't always love painting armor, especially if I have to paint non-metallic metal. It's like I'm rarely volunteering to paint paladins in mass amounts of plate armor. <laughs> I, I don't mind it as much in um, true metallics, but non-metallic metal, it just can take forever to paint that kind of thing. So I'm the kind of painter I like to kind of pre-mix my paint. So a lot of people would just, you know, if, you, if you've been watching um, Michael Proctor's streams at all, he paints while he streams and does his interviews, he'll, he wouldn't do that. He wouldn't really mix that thing in between. He'd get a little bit of this, a little bit of this, maybe do that on the side and apply it, and then he'd keep doing it that way. I, I prefer to kind of have everything ready to go so... Um, I can just apply paint as necessary. So before I paint, or before I paint this section, so I've got that brown color, and I'll just mix some mixes with the orange so that I have kind of a gradation from the original orange through to the brown. And I might end up going darker than that. I'm just, I'm just adding a little more brown to this one. And then what I probably can do is use that Nightmare Black. Let's get a little more of the brown over here. I might be able to use the Nightmare Black to make my darkest shadow. Because I don't think it's going to turn green. 
So now I have a darker brown. There is a lot of clear and it's hard to see. But um, I often mix blue into brown and dark colors. I love to use um, blue liner. Michael Proctor and I do have that in common. We're both like blue liner addicts. So what I want to make this pumpkin look nice and round is I want it to kind of shade darker as it goes down. So, and I could even start darker and then work up. Like I don't have to be super, you know, it's a pumpkin. It's not necessarily going to be super smooth looking. So I'm just trying to get kind of wet blend in a first, a first impression of what I'm going to be trying to do with the paint in general. So where it goes from kind of the middle colors there and it goes darker and then when I work in the highlights I'm going to want them to be up here and that will help the uh, pumpkin appear much rounder. Ring says he loves painting non-metallic metal and rarely uses metallics. Um, I, I get, I'm, I'm just such a fussy painter that painting the non-metallic ends up taking a long time and I start getting impatient. It, it, and it does, it take the payoff is delayed. I think that's probably the other thing that I, a lot of things you paint, and this is, you know, advice for those of you who are trying non-metallic metal, maybe, or there's some other effects where this happens too, and you're getting frustrated because it doesn't look good. There are some effects that they aren't going to look good until you're almost done. So until you have, you know, like I'm roughing this in so it's going to work, better here but if I were doing this a normal layering way I'll do it on this side so first I'm painting this layer on and then I'm gonna let it dry like I'm not gonna see that dramatic shadow build up right away on the pumpkin it's not that big a deal even if I just have a little bit happening I'm at least seeing where I'm going but on something like non metallic metal it's not gonna you're not really gonna see where you're going until you start getting into it into a little more uh, Mintros24 says they're still learning non-metallic metal and usually end up just overpainting it with metallic. So you may be suffering partly what I'm talking about where you're, you're in the middle phase and it looks like crap and you're feeling like, well, I must be bad at this. I don't get how to do this. Ride it out. Try to get to the end and then decide and then leave it a day. Like don't decide that night, come back to it the next day and then see if you think it, it doesn't look like what you wanted and you want to paint it over with metallic. Painterly Get asks, am I going to use the second greatest Reaper color ever made, Hallowed Orange? Um, I did not bring that over, but I could run over to my paint area and get that one. And Ring says, non-metallic metal is time consuming, but the more you do it, the faster you get. And this is true, and this is true of many things. Which is, I'm, and so to, to kind of encourage Mintrose, the first time I painted non-metallic metal that I, that I didn't, that I did like, it took a long time. I was painting a sword, and um, so it it had like four faces, you know, four planes. And I think it took me two hours or something to paint the whole sword the first time I did it. Like I had, I had to use uh, drying extender in my paint because it was taking so long. But eventually I got more and more familiar with doing that technique. I learned some other techniques, and now it's not nearly as... Painful. So pumpkins are probably a good thing to practice um, layering on because like hair, you know, it's not as dramatic as hair, but there are little streaks and textures in the pumpkin skin. So if the blend isn't 100%, you know, you just use kind of lines and, and work on improving it. So I was giving an example of doing layers the longer way on this side. So I'll just add a little bit more there. Then I went too far. So it's, it's starting to build up to be the same way. So both are valid. You know, I could build it up gradually or I can kind of start with my darkness. And this is a good way to help push your contrast if you're having trouble with that. Start with my darkness and then, or in the case of highlights, lightness, and then work my way up and make it look good. 
so I can try and do it in a way where I'm making it look good the whole time. Or I can rough in roughly the location of where I want things and how, you know, dark or light I want things and then fix it. And if you are working on contrast, I think the rough it in and then fix it method is probably more effective because it will help you, will help push you to, to uh, go more extreme than you're likely to go if you're doing the, gra like if I was painting gradually, I would probably decide that that was fine. But then once I got the whole miniature done, I would likely find that I had not gone dark enough. Domel says, I tried non-metallic metal for the first time, took forever because I was so intimidated by it. There were days I didn't even dare pick up the miniature, but it turned all right in the end. Well, that good on you for pushing through it because that I think really is the key with some of these, you know, when you start trying things that are a little bit out of your comfort zone, techniques or effects that you think are more advanced. Um, a lot of those, I think what makes them tough is you got to ride it out. You got to just keep with it before you decide whether or not it sucks. And that's tough because, you know, we, we want to know whether our efforts are having any effect. Like you don't want to just sit there wasting your time. You feel like you're wasting your time, but you're going to waste more time if you're wiping out stuff that's okay. Like if you got it more than you think you got it but you end up wiping it out because you got frustrated and you decided it wasn't working. You might take years or months longer to do something that you could have already been doing because you had figured it out. I don't know if I'm saying that very eloquently, but hopefully it makes a little sense. So the jaw kind of of the pumpkin sticks out a little, so I may not go down quite as dark there. And then to paint the teeth well, I think I have to decide which direction the light is coming from a little because, you know, it's going to be hitting one side of the notch and not the other. I'm just building up a little more base color there. So even with this, I'm ending up going back and forth a little bit. And it's not, you know, totally awesome because I'm just trying to rough it in. But I can always come back to it later and decide to try to perfect a blend more later. I don't necessarily have to get it all right from moment one. But now, since we had a request for Howard Orange, I'm going to go look and see if I can find my Howard Orange. And before I forget, I'm going to show the dried color swatches. So there's the pumpkin orange dried. There's the nightmare black. And you can see how blue in the undertone it is. These got reversed. So this was my bottle from 2020, breast cancer awareness pink. And this is 2021. They're pretty much the same, but I just thought I'd check for in case. But then there's also a new option for breast cancer awareness pink this year. That's kind of the salmon pink that I really like. I like it even more dry. Because last time I did swatches, I forgot to show you all the dry ones. So <laughs> let's see. Oh, non-metallic metal is quite a hot comment uh, generator. Ring said non-metallic metal on a large dragon. Now that is something I have not yet accomplished. I have a gold dragon sitting on my to-do 
shelf and have been scared to touch it. Wow, yeah, that's a lot of non metallic metal. <laughs> so many surfaces. And Curse said, for Argent the Silver Dragon, I intend on doing a pearlescent white with some silver flecks at the edges. Ooh, that sounds really pretty. I look forward to seeing that. All right, so I got my hallowed orange, which is this one. This is another special edition color. Um, but I was planning on mixing this into the pumpkin orange. It probably wouldn't be exactly the same, but it will still, basically you want a lighter orange. So whatever way you get there is fine. I'll show you what it looks like on the palette. Okay, after I use a pokey tool, I'll show you what it looks like on the palette. Sometimes you have to be stubborn. I don't know if it's possible that this is having the Let's check. So I've been going through some of my paints lately because I realized that I was way years behind in my paint maintenance. So that is the hallowed orange. Now this has a little bit more, it's a little bit more opaque, I think, than the pumpkin orange. So I'm going to be, have to be a little careful not to get chalky highlights as I go up because that's one of the things that frustrates you with uh, highlights, particularly if you're layering, is you will often have to you know, thin down or make more transparent your um, highlight layers to not get streaks and stuff. And I lost my brush, so I'm just looking for that. And I'm gonna need something a little lighter too. So I got this buckskin pale, so rather than white or pure yellow, I'm gonna go with that for I need more highlights. And I bet that that would work pretty good to lighten up the pumpkin orange too. I didn't do my thing where I made my little pools. So has anyone been painting some Halloween stuff or have plans to paint some Halloween stuff? I guess you, people could argue that what we paint all the time is Halloween stuff. <laughs> Painting undead and monsters and stuff like that. That's what makes it fun. Ring says Buckskin Pale is in his top 75 core colors. That's pretty handy. I think mine's a little thick, so I'm just going to it down a little and then make my brightest highlight layers or brighter highlight layers. When I paint next week, one of the reasons I thought it would be fun to do the non-metallic metal, or not non-metallic, monochromatic color screen is um, I'll probably have all the paint mixed up in advance even before I start the stream. And one of the fun things about monochromatic is that it's very fast to paint because you just have those, that's all you got. You've got your range from light to dark and everything has to be painted in that range. So it can make it a very fast way to paint. I mean, it doesn't necessarily apply to every figure Although I think there's a European figure. I feel like it's Anna. I don't know if she even uses her last name. But I think she paints by painting everything monochromatically first and then glazing color over it. So it's kind of like, uh, you know, Zenithal Prime, but you're doing all of this stuff, all of the making your transitions and putting your values in for shadows and highlights with um you know a monochromatic color of paint and then adding the color on top I'm not sure if i just made the wrong choice with those two i meant wrong choice in terms of where the light direction is so adding these highlights up top will also help make it look round 
And you may be thinking, why do I have to make it look round? The sculptor, who I believe was Julie, Julie, was this you? Um, has already made it look round for us. And that's true, but it's also not true because our guys are small enough, our figures are small enough that they don't always look fully three-dimensional unless we, we do this part because the painting of the shadows and the highlights, that's really what it's for. It's to make them look fully three-dimensional and as if they were being lit, lit by an in-scale light source. So if you could carry around a little lamp over your figure all the time, you know, you had a little, little light over the figure, um, the light would do it for you. But our big giant lights are a totally different scale to the little figures, so it doesn't look right. So I'm just adding back in some of the original pumpkin orange because I don't have enough kind of in the middle. It's really easy to, typically we call it losing your midtone. Rings Raccoon is working on something kind of spooky season themed. And Dalmel is organizing their STL file collection, which is going to take a while. And Painterly gets Reaper Order is at the border currently. So they're painting orcs until uh, orcs for October. <laughs> That's hilarious. I don't know how that got started. I saw somebody posting that and I thought that was fun. Until uh, the Reaper Order starts. Yeah, it's interesting in the traditional uh, painting, you know, like painting pictures and drawings and stuff like that. October is a really big month for painting challenges. So Inktober is the big one. Um, but there was Drawtober even. I think the first, when I first started uh, learning to draw, I ended up doing Drawtober first. I think I saw that before Inktober. Um, and then some people have alternatives as well. but I'm usually busy painting Reaper things, so it's not always the best timing for me for painting or drawing challenges or whatever. We were denied a proper Orktober a few years ago because of reasons and no orcs were released, so we've been left to continue the Orktober traditions on our own. Don Mal's wife is doing Inktober. Well, I hope she's having fun doing that. I had fun last year um, doing it, and Mike Disney and Teton do some fantastic stuff for Inktober. Ink is, ink is challenging for me. It's a very unforgiving, you know, this, this acrylic paint is very forgiving. If I screw up, I just paint over it and nobody knows I screwed up. And ink is a little more like, nope, you screwed up and everyone's going to get to know about it. Um, but yeah, for, for some reason, I just, I don't know. I just haven't been uh, doing a lot of traditional art lately. I'd been really good about doing something almost every day for years. And I just kind of got out of the vibe and I'm trying not to be too pushy with myself. You know, I want to get back to it. I do want to push myself back into it. But I decided that doing something kind of high stress deadline like um, Inktober was not the way for me to go this year. Not that I've ever com successfully completed one of those challenges, but I've always had a lot of fun and learned stuff doing them. Usually something happens, like I have to start painting the Christmas miniatures for uh, Reaper or something like that, and I never really... One year I just stopped, like I think I painted 28 out of the 31 days, and I was just like, meh, I think I'm just done with this. I do them for my own purpose, not to publish a book or make cool videos or anything like that, so when I'm done, I'm done. I want to kind of make the teeth look a little creepier. Also, he's got these super fun eyebrows. Definitely want to get a little more highlights on those super fun eyebrows. Let's see if I, this part kind of looks like brown line. So here, because the, you know, the pumpkin has segments, 
I'm not putting the highlights like in a solid band. I'm kind of trying to show that those segments round a little by just putting a little extra bit of highlighting in the middle there. I may even, I think I need some yellow, yellow. Ring Shaccoon says, traditional art has been my job for 15 years. I've had a really hard time getting my brushes to canvas. Yeah, it used to kind of be my um, break from, you know, the, the miniature paintings were my job and the other stuff was the just for me. But for some reason, it switched around and I'm just more excited about miniature painting right now. So uh, when I opened my bottle of uh, Oxide Yellow, it had the same problem where I hadn't shaken it. The other paints that I've been using I shook before. The stream started and I forgot that I meant to add these colors for my browns. So I did not prep them up. Yeah, it's hard. Art, art blocks and stuff like that are hard. And I think it is good to kind of, you know, not just give yourself an excuse to get out of it because then you'll never do anything again. And presumably you're doing the thing because you like it. I mean, I know sometimes people fall out of miniature painting uh, and they have the same problem where they haven't painted in a while. And I think it helps to remember your, why you like doing the thing. But sometimes you just need a break. Sometimes you just got to do something else. And that's, if you're, if you're stuck like in an army project or something like that, that's one reason why getting something like these little um, Bonesylvanian guys, it's like just a totally different style and subject from what you usually paint. That can be a great way to reignite your interest. So it may be, I just need to do something like that with traditional art where I just, you know, may, I don't, I normally work very representational. Maybe I need to just goof around with color and, and do abstract stuff and not have any expectations about what it's supposed to look like for a while and just, just enjoy the supplies, even if I'm not making amazing art. You don't have to meet anyone's expectations but your own. I think is partly what I'm trying to say. We put a lot of pressure on ourselves that we don't need to. And I just, I like to try to come here and be honest with you guys about my struggles because I know that you guys are struggling too. And I want you to know that it is not weird. It is not weird to have times when you struggle. I mean, last year I was having a lot of trouble with miniature painting, just a certain kind. So it's like something like this, where I would just sit down and slap some miniature, some paint on something. I was fine with that, doing the non-metallic metal where it would take, you know, a thousand years. And a lot. like, I just didn't have the patience. I was like, I just, this is torture. I don't want to be here. I don't want to do this. So the last year's little uh, Christmas dragon, who turned out great in the end, I am happy that I, that I stuck with it. It was a little painful while I was doing it. Now all this stuff, so the that little dragon um, had a lot of presents, and that was fun. Like it, there were paint brushes and paints and toys, and all, so those little things I could just you know finish each one of them up pretty quickly, and I had a ton of fun doing those. It was just the the focus of sitting down and doing the same thing for so long that was going to take such a long time until I had the payoff of it looking good. That was the part that was all stressful. So you can see that kind of bumping up the highlights around the face, I think has helped. And I may need to smooth those out a little. Dom L fell out of miniature painting for 20 years. Well, we're very happy to have you back and I hope you're having fun with it. And Ring said, I think that's the source of my block. Expectation, mine, and the fear of my customers. Yeah, it's, it's hard. It's harder when you're doing it as a business thing and you have customers. I mean, first of all, you're doing it as a business thing, you need to eat. Um, but then you also have to deal with other people's expectations and that can be tough. And sometimes the people don't, you know, what you're really excited about painting is not what people are really excited about paying you to paint. And that's a different problem. I'm lucky in that I'm usually pretty, like I, I don't, I find the challenge within the thing that, you know, Reaper or Dark Sword or whoever asked me to paint, uh, I can kind of fit in what I like doing into painting for them. And I realize that I'm very lucky to either have that mindset or have customers that 
give me projects that I can do that with. Because I know for a lot of creatives who make a living off being creative, the, the struggle is not getting to do what you really want to do sometimes. But then you don't want to do it when it's not work time because you already did that all day. I know, it looks a little rougher on screen than it does to me in person. I'm not sure why, but this is often true when I paint for you guys on screen. I mean, I'm not saying it's like perfectly amazing or anything, but. So yeah, so this has been the pumpkin orange that is in the ghoulie bag. And then I use some hallowed orange for some highlights, but then I also use some oxide. Uh, oh, I'm showing you things that aren't showing up at all. Uh, so the examples of colors you're getting to see are the, the, the pumpkin orange, hallowed orange, but then for the lighter highlights, I mix this um, oxide yellow with buckskin pale. So the hallowed orange is a great color, but for this particular um, type of character, it was going a little too desaturated. So that's why I went and added some of the yellow oxide. So there are some areas here probably do with some smoothing but I'm not going to worry about that too much but what I do want to do and you see that I left this till last because well it might not be last because I might come back and pull up some more but there was no point really in filling in the crevice lines while I was still working other stuff because chances were good that I was just going to cover over that and I may end up using two colors so I'm going to try this color up top no nope, that's probably even too light I'm going to try this color And then I might have to go a little darker. In the crevices at the bottom. And that's because, so I, I have this super dark color on the shadows at the bottom. So if I put a color in that's lighter, it's obviously not going to work to shadow crevices. So I'm going to have to take my darkest color. I make that in. I am on screen, right? And then I might have to go with something kind of in between just to clean up the color. Um, Moon Glum Minis asks, for my goggles, what is my magnification enhancement? I actually have a couple of different pairs. Um, this one that I use on stream is not, uh, like the top level. I think it's two times. Optivisor numbers their lenses differently, so it, the, the 10 is the highest magnification. So I think I'm using a 5 for stream. And I'll use a 7 or a 10 for um, doing detail work. Uh, and I, I, I usually, so I used to use like the highest magnification, which I think was three or four times is what um, Optivisor uses. I used to use that for just about everything. And then that was the, here, I'll show you this because this is, it was a bit of a game changer. So I think it's worth showing you guys. Probably one day I should do it just to. Just a stuff I use thing. So this is the classic Optivisor. I bet Bob and Julie have these too. All the sculptors used to have these. So, um, you know, it's, it's a little, it's large and it goes around your whole head. And I don't find it heavy. I, I would get the plastic lenses. These lenses come in both plastic uh, and glass. So the plastic lens is more easily damaged and mine actually is. But, um, and this is actually just a seven, it's not the 10. Um, but this is 
my second or third lens plate. But then you'll see here that I have some cloth wrapped around the headband because it just gets super sweaty, especially in the summer. But eventually they came out with this. So there was a, a style of visor like this that was called Mag Eyes and I tried it. Uh, they sell it for crafters. I think I got it in one of the craft stores. And I just, I don't know, I just didn't like it. It wasn't terrible. It wasn't, I bought a knockoff, not a visor like this that was not Optivisor brand. And that was like Cinderella's visor. I'm looking. I finally found someone who could put it on and their eyes didn't go squiggly. And I gave it to them because I'm like, enjoy. No one else is ever going to be able to use it. But this new kind uh, from Donegan, which are the same people that make the Optivisor, is called the Optisite. So it's lighter. Um, it doesn't go around your whole head. It's really easy to lift it up and down. I've even seen some people kind of wear it like a headband if they want it a little closer to their eyes. And I just find it a ton more comfortable to wear. So I have two of these um, and I put a different plate in. Unfortunately, you can't see the numbers of the plates on this one. You could see it on the other one. Um, it comes with three plates. So if you buy one of these, it comes with three different magnification plates so you can try it out and figure out what kind you like. Um, so I actually stepped down in magnification even though my eyes are worse than I buy focals now. Um, for everyday painting, but for prep or if I'm doing like eyes and detail work, I will put on a higher magnification pair. So I have two, um, and then I, I thought those original ones I had on the high, you know, that old style Optivisor, I thought I had it on the highest magnification that I would use for details, but it turns out that I don't. So maybe I should go get the 10 plate. But the thing to remember about magnification and the reason I'm using less magnification for streaming is it also determines how close you have to hold the miniature. So the higher the magnification, the closer you have to hold the miniature to see it. So because I'm using this lower magnification, I can hold the figure out about this far and see it, which means that I don't have to you know, bang my head against the camera or end up putting my face in front of the camera. Uh, Dommel says he, that they use reading glasses, which wouldn't work if you wear glasses already. Yes, if you don't wear glasses, all you have to do is go to the drugstore and um, try out some of the readers. I would bring a figure with you um, and look at it with the, the, um, the reading glasses and see which magnification that you like for that function. Um, you can get them made. I'm pretty sure that um, Michael Proctor, you know, since he does this a lot and he wants to do it well, got, you know, reading glasses made from his optometrist. And I think he took the miniature in and showed them, you know, what we do as well as part of that. But yeah, this is one of those things where just like I will always advocate for a real brush, I will always advocate for getting the real brand name Optivisor because I ended up spending more money getting a knockoff. I think I ended up doing it because like my visor broke or something or actually I, there was one con I went to that I came back and I didn't have my visor. So I think it was probably up to that. And um, I think I just bought what was in the store but it was just so terrible that I couldn't handle it and I had to order away for the real, the real optimizer. And back when all of the sculptors were sculpting uh, in physical media, every single one of them had a real optimizer. So I think that says something too. Because they are definitely doing this as their job and trying to do it as well as possible. Great well, sir. Happy Thanksgiving back. Yes, it's so, uh, for those who are unaware, it is Thanksgiving today in Canada, which is where I'm originally from. Yes, we do Thanksgiving on Monday. I know, that's weird. And it's not, so it's not a four-day um, holiday.
holiday. Now, where we get the extra holiday is at Christmas. Um, so we get the day after Christmas is Boxing Day. And that's our four-day holiday. But I like uh, the timing of Canadian Thanksgiving better because now, you know, if you had Thanksgiving now and you think about it, then that's a nice long break between eating turkey again and dealing with all your family drama again and stuff. So I, I think it's good timing. I find American uh, holiday season to be kind of a lot. It's a lot if you're an introvert. It's like you got to go, you got to do a lot of people things from Thanksgiving until New Year's Day. And that's a lot. But the other, so this is a busy day, I guess, because, so traditionally it's Columbus Day, and, okay, yeah, I think it's better that we're, that we're talking about sugar skulls and stuff like that, because it's also uh, Indigenous Peoples Day, which is not celebrated in every state, but we can celebrate it if we want to, I would say. as well exploring is a tremendous achievement it's not really the case that nobody was here the thing that was being discovered was already a thing to many people and the discovering did not turn out that great for them so I'm just I actually switched to um, troll hide for my green instead of using the, I haven't done my little swatch on this one yet, instead of using the, I like the green that I mixed from the uh, pumpkin orange and nightmare black, but it was, it was kind of lower coverage and on these little tiny areas that just makes things take forever. So I switched to the troll green and now I'm just adding a little bit of that. Um, so I use nightmare black in the shadows and then I'm adding a little of the oxide yellow to make some highlights. But now, well, first let me check the time actually. I am over time. Um, yes, thank you, Quindy. <laughs> Grey Master said truth and reconciliation was September 30th. Uh, in Canada, yes. Uh, so Indigenous Peoples Day is in America today. Um, Graymaster said we were put on lockdown. The guy on the radio was like, best Thanksgiving ever, no lock-in loss. <laughs> wow, you're back on lockdown again. Um, so that's as far as I got on this, which, um, you know, I really just need to work on the owl. And maybe I'll keep him... I don't, I think I will, it will probably take the entire stream to paint this even in monochrome. Um, but just for the benefit of those who came a little later, I'll go quickly through the photos. So these figures are all things that you can get on um, Reaper right now. So this is if you get um, a purchase of $20 or more, you would get this for free. It's a graveyard arch. I didn't have one in person to show you. This is part of the um, ghoulie bag, which includes the nightmare black paint and the pumpkin orange paint that I was painting with today. You also get delicious candy. Uh, well, this is a sugar skull that I painted on a plaster skull from a local art store, but I just put it in there when, from when I was talking about the sugar skulls. Then this is uh, Howie the fish man. So he's one of the uh, figures you can buy right now that are like the familiars that I was painting. Um, and there he is from the front, and there's a view of his fish. Then this is the um, Mary, is it Mary? No, it's Betty. Mary is the mermaid. It's Betty the Ghost Bride. So this is what I'm gonna paint next week, and I'm going to try to paint a very similar color scheme. That's why I said it's monochromatic, because it's ghost. Uh, and these were the colors I used, so all of these with pure white are no longer in production, but I've worked out some alternative colors uh, so that you can have a try at painting something similar if you like. Grey Mouser's wife stole all the candy. <laughs> and then this is Jake. You may know him by another name. 
He was fond of paint. This is Maddie the Medusa. And she comes with her own friends, I guess, because she has snakes for hair. Then this is Mary, Mary the Mermaid, or I think of her as the crazy ex-girlfriend. She's got that look in her eyes. This is Elsa. And her companion is Boris. So they're sold separately, but if you get them together, you can pose them uh, as if they're holding hands, which Bob Rodolfi did such a great job sculpting those. These were originally actually put out as a, a Valentine's promotional item. And I think, oh yeah, there was one more view of them. And there's our Jan. So there are a couple more of those. Um, I was just showing the ones uh, that I painted because I had high quality photos of those ones. But thank you all for coming. I hope that you're starting to get in the Halloween spirit and that you uh, enjoyed that. And I hope you'll join me next week to paint uh, in monochromatic because it's, it's an interesting exercise. And I hope that you'll enjoy watching me try so then you will go try. And then also come back next week and tell me what you've been painting for Halloween spooky stuff. So I'm pretty sure that uh, Quindy can get us a fun raid so that you guys don't have to stop watching if you're still... If you're still interested in watching people create, I'm sure she'll find something for us to do. And thank you all for coming. I hope you have a great rest of your day.